Soon afterwards, having stolen horses from outside a barber shop, they left behind the safety of crowded streets for the wild, lonely moors. They were outlaws. Moor gave way to dense forests, where they slept the night in terror of wolves and wild boar and Spaniards. But the next day, just when their empty stomachs seemed to be flapping against their backbones, they smelled roast meat. Now I know this mirror be magic, said Walter, for we've escaped being murdered twice, and now we won't starve either. He was looking at the extraordinary sight of a table spread with linen and heaped with cold chicken, hams, bottles, pies and loaves. Nearby, a skinned deer slumped round slowly on a big metal spit being turned by a small boy. He stared round eyed at them as they filled their saddlebags with food, stolen from his master's hunting breakfast. B -b be you outlaws, he said. Ma said I was to look out for him. Ma said these forests been crawling with outlaws ever since Robin Hood. Mm, that's right, we be murderous cutthroats, said Judith, cramming her mouth with venison. Oh, said the little boy, and wound the spit handle a little faster. My master be back presently. Him and his hounds will tear thee to pieces. Not before I do, said the sailor from behind them. The little boy gave a shriek and jerked the spit so that the roasting venison sagged and dropped into the fire beneath it, scattering burning brands across the forest floor. The sailor's horse reared up, unseating him, and Walter and Judith ran. But on foot, how far could they hope to keep ahead of a man with a drawn saber? In the next clearing stood a half-built house. Its timber frame was made from trees cut down round about it. The jagged stump still stood there, like dwarfs keeping guard. The children did not notice the deep saw pit dug in the ground, and they fell into it, as if into their graves, and Judith's dress tore on the sharp teeth of a bow saw. There was nobody working by the pit to see them fall in. There was only the sailor, leaning over the edge, slashing and stabbing at them with his saber and grinning broadly. Now do you see that it be fate for Drake's magic to fall into Spanish hands? A noise made him turn his head sharply. And fifty hounds washed over him like the sea. The dogs were followed by a dozen huntsmen, each with a club in his hand and a crossbow in the other. They beat the sailor aside as if he were a branch across their path, baying and complaining. He spoiled the scent. He's crossed the trail. The rascal has ruined the hunt. A rickety ladder stood against the side of the pit. When Walter and Judith dared to climb it, with gibbering legs and beating hearts, they found their horses grazing peacefully inside the half-built house. There was no sign of the huntsman or of the sailor, and by nightfall they were leaving behind the forest and entering a landscape of cornfields, pig runs and cattle farms. Next day, they were sitting wearily by the road, their backs against the garden wall of a big house, while their horses cropped the grass. They say shamrocks be lucky, said Walter, gazing up at the three clover leaf emblems on the ornamental gate. Should we make a wish, do you think? But before they could wish for good luck, a ramshackle cart pulled up in front of them. A man and a woman asked if they could spare some food. So they shared out all that was left of the hunt breakfast, and all ate together. Where are you bound? asked the man. To Plymouth. But we be clear wore out, said Judith. Nay, then, travel along with us, said the wife. We've been turned off our land with no place to go, and yours is as good a road as any for us to take. Tie your horses on behind our cart, and we'll carry you on your way some. Judith and Walter looked at each other. They were so tired, so very tired. So they climbed up into the wagon and gave themselves up to the kindness of the man and the woman and to the gentle rocking of the cart. They paid no attention to the countryside they passed through. They let it jolt by them for a day and a night and slept more peacefully than they had done since they left their comfortable beds in London.
When they woke, a strangely urgent wind was nudging the wagon, and big drops of rain wrapped on the canvas overhead as if to say, Wake up, get up, quick, quick. The cart stood beside a fast-moving river. The shafts were empty. The man and the woman were gone. Their good saddle horses were stolen. Walter and Judith were alone and quite, quite lost with nothing to their name but Drake's mirror tucked inside Walter's jacket. Far in the distance, across the flat landscape, they could see two church spires. A city, surely. But they were on the other side of the river. To reach the city, they must cross over. They found a hide-covered boat tied to the bank. It must have belonged to some local fisherman who used it to fetch in eels from traps in the middle of the river. They pulled a piece of canvas off the wagon to keep off the rain and huddled together under it while Judith gouged at the water with a single short paddle. But it was impossible to steer and the river was running much too fast. The little round coracle carried them spinning and bobbing downstream. The paddle was fit only for fending off rocks and logs and rafts of twigs. During the night, they often felt the boat grate and bumped violently up against things. Hour after hour they sailed, faster all the time. They passed villages, towns, even a city with a massive scowling castle. But they did not try to beach their boat. They kept on waiting and hoping for the flow to slacken, for the rain to ease off, for the wind to drop. But the longer they waited, the darker the cloak of rain pulled round the sky and the louder the rattle of wind in the canvas over their heads. Great cleavers of lightning hacked and opened the skyline and thunder seemed to burst out of the floor of the river in fountains of black foam. At last, they spun helter-skelter into a market town where big new brick and timber houses crowded down to the river. A mob of people watching the flood from a broad stone bridge spotted the boat and shrieked out excitedly. They pointed and shouted and reached down their hands to snatch water and Judith to safety. The river was so high that there seemed hardly room for the coracle to scrape underneath the arch of the bridge. Catch hold! Catch hold! shouted the crowd. And Judith threw aside the paddle, pushed the canvas cover into the river and gingerly rose to her knees and reached up with both hands. Then, among the rescuers on the bridge, she saw a face which made her cower down again and push Walter's head towards the bottom of the boat. The coracle swept under the bridge with a roaring of water through the stone. The Spaniard overhead gave a triumphant shout of surprise and snatched up the reins of his horse. He dogged their little boat, splashing along the waterlogged riverbank, pointing his saber as if he were making a curse. He was so close, they could see the spittle in his beard and hear his panting breaths. Faith has given you into my hands. At the next bridge, I'll have you. At the next bridge. A curve of the road drove them further off. With every mile, the water moved faster, rose higher, spilled further and further over the banks. It washed all manner of wreckage into the flood. Trees, bushes, boats, fences. The little coracle whirled like a cartwheel at full tilt. The rain beat down and the drowned world spun by until Judith and Walter were almost too giddy and sick to be afraid. The lights of a village marked the spot where a road crossed the swollen river. And there on the bridge, as good as his word, a sailor waited. The arch of the bridge was choked with driftwood. The coracle, already half full of rainwater, bounced up against it, again and again. The sailor leaned down his bruised, ferocious face towards them as they clung by their fingertips to the bridge's slimy stone. Give me up the mirror, and I'll maybe lift you up. Walter reached into his jacket. Don't, Walter. Once he has it, he'll leave us to drown. Walter's hand wavered in midair and the mirror dished a white flash of lightning directly into the sailor's eyes. He made a snatch at the circle of light and overbalanced, ah! pitching over the parapet and into the boat. Promptly, it burst through the dam of driftwood, carrying all three on down the river. Even half full of water, even under the extra weight, the coracle stayed afloat. 
round about them a scene very like the end of the world unfolded. A painted bear lurched up with them out of the water, and inside it had washed away. A woman floating along in a haystack shrieked like a screech owl. The thatch of the moon came by, like the bristly back of some foul water monster. A cart danced past them, pointing its shafts at the moon. And then a church loomed out of the flood like Noah's Ark. I have it now, yelled the Spaniard, staring at his own wild reflection in the mirror. And so I drown. Drake's magic will drown with me in Spanish hands. Water sprang up to grab the mirror. It fell between them into the swilling bottom of the boat. In his fury, the Spaniard took both brother and sister by the collar and flung them into the breathless brown sucking water just as the coracle pitched over a weir. There were lanterns swinging away to the left, and voices shouting, Swim! Swim for the church! Judith and Walter kicked off their boots and swam towards the shouts. Under their feet they found rising ground. Grace them snagged them from below water like giant white teeth. Then friendly hands had them by the clothing and hair, and they were wading wading through a churchyard awash with water. "'Tis the worst storm I ever saw or heard tell of," said the rector with great satisfaction. "'Did you hear the crash when Grange Mill fell down?' But all water could do was to sob and rock to and fro in his sister's arms and say, "'It's gone. It's gone. I lost it.' I lost Drake's mirror. What's that he's saying? asked the rector. What's he lost? So Judith told him. And he slapped his knees and laughed out loud. Faith, child, what nonsense are you telling me? Oh, it is a remarkable chance that brought you swimming to my church door. For my name's Philip Jones. And afore I came to this parish to fill my father's place, I was chaplain to Sir Francis Drake. I was privy to his secrets and privy to his ships. There's no magic about that man. No, nor much luck either, as I recall. There was genius in plenty, and wit, and fire. Aye, and downright sea dog cunning. The man has salt water in his veins. What call is Drake for magic, when he has wit enough to thrash the Spaniards off the face of the sea? Faith, how rumours do make fools of men. One Spaniard talks of a magic mirror, and all of a sudden, fifty thousand believe it. And now some poor soul has gone to his death for nothing. He'll maybe swim ashore, said Judith softly. But the rector said, I fear there's one thing I learned while I served with Sir Francis Drake. Sailors never learn to swim. The storm died, the flood drained away, and Rector Philip Jones set the children on the road for London. They were glad enough to go. Suddenly they longed to be home. In that remote part of the world, news took months to arrive. Anything could be happening in Southwark. The invasion might have begun. London streets might be a swarm with Spanish soldiers. Their hearts were not at peace until they were home again. Oh, the relief to be free of the worry of the mirror. The relief to be welcomed home like naughty runaway children and hugged and scolded and wept over and hugged again. But afterwards... They could not help but think now and then about that foolish, mistaken treasure of theirs. They pictured it, sunk in the ooze of that brown river, alongside the bones of the Spanish spy. And Walter said that even if it was not the luck of Sir Francis Drake, still it must have had some magic to it. It must. Or how could they be alive, there in Southwark, drinking their father's ale and eating their mother's dove pie? It was seven weeks before Philip Jones and the people of his rained, soaked little village learned the news. 
the very storm which had swept past their doorsteps had scattered the Spanish invasion fleet. Far away from that peaceful little village, the gales had dashed the armada to pieces on the rocks of Scotland and Ireland, or sunk them to the unmapped bed of the sea. Queen Elizabeth called it the breath of God that had sunk King Philip's ships. But those unhappy Spanish sailors, whose galleons were torn to pieces like bears in a bear pit, never stopped cursing the devilish luck of Sir Francis Drake.